Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Jacuzzi Performance Podcast. I'm Ed Baxter, and today we're joined by European, World, and Paralympic champion, Jessica Jane Applegate, MBE. Thanks for joining us, Jessica. Thanks for having me. So I guess, first of all, you're just back from the European Championships, just added four more titles to your collection. How are you feeling after it? Um, I was actually really pleased considering the little amount of training and access to an actual swimming pool I had. Um, but some of the times I produced, I was really pleased with at this time in the season. So I'm really excited going forward as to what could happen in the future. Yeah, I think it must be really exciting. Like you said there, you haven't really had access to a swimming pool, but you know that you're still very dominant across all the different events you swam. You know, four races, four goals. Mm -hmm. that, must, that must feel great. Yeah, it was really good, but me being the hard person I am, I'm always taking into consideration it was the Europeans and not everyone from the world was there. Yeah. Um, so I'm always looking to better myself and I'm really tough on myself, so I already know what I want to be doing um, in the next few months, so um, go back to training really hard. So, like you're saying there, you're very, very tough on yourself. What did you, what went well, what didn't, what are you thinking, right, moving towards Tokyo, that's what I'm going to really hone in on. Um, so the two under three was probably the hardest race, probably because it was the longest and required the most amount of fitness. So yeah. um, I suffered a bit in that one. Um, and then my 100 free and 100 fly were both straight finals, so I didn't have an opportunity to Get go heat up. to final and okay. practice. So it was a good chance to try going all out straight away. Um, and there's specific things in there that I need to work on. So my 100 fly absolutely died. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's probably a fitness element to that and probably working on how I go out in my race. Um, and then the 100 freestyle is for a relay event. So that will be depending on where I swim in the race as well, um, depending on whether I need to work on a start or a takeover. Yeah. Um, because my start going into that race was, it was <laughs> not good. Um, just because we were rushed a bit out, to be fair. Um, okay. I was the last one out and it was pretty much two months ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's your, do you prefer the individuals or is the relay where you kind of come alive? Because I know some people are, you know, they get to the individual events and they find it really hard to do it for themselves. When it's mm -hmm. for a team, they're just a different person. Um, I feel like I'm, I can go for both. Um, some days, though, I have a mental switch where I'm just like, doesn't really matter how fast the other person's going, I want to beat them, yeah. literally. But other times I'm like, oh, they're so fast, how am I going to beat them? But um, the relay is going to be hard because it's a mixed relay and I am the slowest in the relay, so I feel like I've got to step up my game to not let anyone down. Yeah, do you, do you like that pressure or is that something that you... Um, I feel like if I didn't have the pressure, I'd probably be too relaxed. Okay. So, so you yeah. feel like when you've got to step on it for the team, you kind of yeah. kind of come into your own. Yeah. That's cool. So you you mentioned there around a few things that you, you kind of struggled with. So for those watching at home, can you kind of give us an overview of, I guess, para swimming and then where you sit within the different classifications? Yeah, so um, I'll run through all of them. S1 to S10 is physical classes. S11 to 13 is visual. And then 14 is intellectual, which is me. Um, I have a... I have many learning disabilities, it's not just a one or two, I have that. And then I also have autism on the side, which isn't part of the S14. Um, and then the Paralympics works is like we have events divided up between all of the classes um, and the events that I can compete in are 200 free, 200 IM, 100 back, 100 breast, 100 fly, and then we have the relay of the 100 free. So in those ones, which do you see as your main event? It used to be the 200 free, okay. but um, the 100 fly got added in 2018. And I always used to love the 100 fly. I used to enter it even if I wasn't like allowed to compete in it. So I was really excited when that one got added. That's cool. So it probably is torn between the 200 free and the 100 fly, and then probably next 100 back. But you probably wouldn't catch me doing breaststroke. <laughs> 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 okay. So, um, so going back to the disability and how it affects your specific mm -hmm. performance, you know, what are the... How does it affect your performance in the pool, I guess? Um, I feel like with the 14s, it can be very different between all of us. Okay. Um, so one of my main factors is my reaction can be a bit rubbish compared to some others. Um, and I am crazy forgetful. Like oh, really? I can, I'll be swimming at 400 metres and I'll stop after 300 and think, oh, I've done, and I'll turn around <laughs> and my time's three minutes. I'm like, I definitely didn't do that time. <laughs> Um, so my memory is not good um, and I feel like it's hard, really hard to explain to people what a learning disability is because obviously I've lived with it my whole life. Yeah. Um, 
I guess it's kind of normal for you. Yeah, it's normal. Um, I used to struggle to deal with it until I was about 15 years old and I feel like swimming has helped like yeah. a lot. It's made me become a person and not just stress about everything. Um, but like telling time and training, remembering what we're doing, mm. um, remembering what way round in the lane we're supposed to be <laughs> going. Um, and there's lots of little bits that I'm trying to think of, which I can't think of right now. But um, mm. we, I can't do stroke counting. I can't yeah. do any of that. Um, I don't really work off rates. So I literally just look at my time and be like, well, that was good. That okay. was rubbish. <laughs> Um, okay. But I know on feel, so if I go on feel, then I know if it felt good or if it felt bad or not. So is that pretty reliable for you, just how you feel in the water? Is that yeah. pretty much, you're always bang on with, with the way you feel? Yeah, so I know that if I messed up a turn, I'm like, oh, I need to make up for that in the race. Or yeah. Yeah, I normally just go on how I feel rather than, I can't, there's no way I'd be able to count my strokes and count my lengths and everything all at the same time. So I find it really complicated. So my coach and me just worked out a record like thing that I can just go on feel and yeah. that's just what I've been trained to do now. Oh, that's amazing. So uh, going back, you mentioned there just around how swimming was your place to where that, so has that really helped you then swimming? Has swimming helped you kind yeah. of understand and, and improve on some areas you weren't great at? Yeah, definitely. Um, I was never a social person. I used to yeah. struggle to talk to people and then I found like people at swimming, we have a common interest. Yeah. So it was easier to talk about things in the set or I'd, and then I managed to build some relationships with some people that were pretty clever. And they'd tell me halfway through the set, Jess, we're doing this next. Jess, we're doing that next. Just to make sure that I knew what we were doing. Yeah. Um, so that's been a massive help. And then a lot of them have actually taught me how to use a clock. So I've like been watching. I'm quite. A, I'm more of an observer okay. than like a taking part. Yeah. So I observe what people are doing. So that's kind of taught me a lot of things. And then just obviously throughout swimming, my career going the way it has has made me deal with things a lot better like media yeah um socializing and events and stuff like that and learning more and being having access to more information about swimming so would you say that swimming's helped you not just i guess for your performance in the pool but mm. just generally in As life a person, yeah. yeah definitely so where's that contributed most like you said in the socializing the yeah the socializing being able to have a conversation with someone like oh that's amazing yeah i think um, catch me 10 years ago i probably wouldn't have been here really? talking to you <laughs> yeah i think i work with a few para swimmers and it's often not you know obviously you might see massive improvements in the pool but it's often not that it's the just the the general person become way more confident more comfortable yeah. is that something that you've just found the more you swim, the more confident and comfortable you become. Yeah, definitely. And obviously with swimming, you only really swim. You don't really do anything else. Yeah. So you only really meet people that are interested in the same things as you. Yeah. So it makes things a lot easier. Yeah, that's awesome. So if we take a step back to the start of your, I guess where your career blew up, 2012 Olympics, uh, you mentioned before we actually started recording that that was your first major international yeah. at home games. How was, how was that? Um, I think because I turned 16 in the holding camp, um, I was really young and naive and didn't, yeah. to me it was just a competition. I was like, yeah. ah, it's just a competition, <laughs> just gonna go there to do my best, whatever. And then it wasn't until like, I was actually swimming my final, like I felt the pressure between the heats to the finals because I was first fastest. And I remember okay. I actually put up a Facebook post saying, guys like, just because I'm first fastest into the final, please don't expect me to win. Oh, really? Yeah. So why did you, why did you feel like you wanted to say that? Or did you feel a lot of pressure and you didn't want to let people down? Or yeah, what was I it? just didn't want people, people just got really excited and I felt maybe because it was a home one, they were getting too excited and I just didn't want them to be like, ah, oh, yeah. after. Okay. So I just, I remember just writing it and just sending it off and then just turning my phone off and like not thinking so about anything else. Say you hadn't won that, say you come second. Yeah. Would you have seen that as a failure? Mm, if you're already yeah, saying, probably, yeah. if you're already saying, don't, don't watch, I might not, might not win. Yeah. Would you think that second or bronze even would have been a failure? Yeah, to me it would really? have been, yeah. So how come, how come at your first international games, how come that would have been a failure just because of the sports mentality? I of yeah, I feel like to me, I don't like coming second, I don't like coming third. I, like yeah. I actually come fourth two days before. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, a different event? Yeah, so 100 backstroke. Okay. Um, but I didn't put any pressure on myself in that, it wasn't really my event and then... Um, so after the fourth and 100 back, how was it? But then I was cross, back? yeah, oh, really? I was quite cross because I was like, ah, fourth. <laughs> so do you think that um, helped, the 200 free? 
Yeah, it gave me like, at competitions I like to have that first race experience, you get yeah. to experience the crowd, get to experience the pool and everything. Um, but I felt like I would just put it up because I was like, I just didn't want the pressure, I didn't want anyone to be disappointed with me because I knew everyone was really excited because obviously it's home games, everything was televised at the time and it was just a bit mad. My phone was going absolutely crazy and I was like, oh, <laughs> help. <laughs> um, and I just remember sitting in the call, up. well, I always phone my coach just before. So yeah. I phoned my coach just before I went to the call up room and then was like, petrified. Yeah. I was like, I am petrified. Really? Like, and my coach was like, just put your head up, put your goggles on, don't look at anyone. <laughs> just concentrate on your race. Yeah. Um, and we basically, we had, we had a bit of an advantage because we watched the Olympics first. Yeah. And we watched a lot of the Olympians, the GB team, go out too fast. Yeah. Because of the excitement. Yeah, okay. So he was like, just hold back. You've been training the whole time. You know exactly what you need to do on feel. Yeah. Just go and do it and you'll be fine. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So you mentioned you felt like you were very naive going into that, yeah. that whole competition. Do you actually feel that helped you then? Yeah, because I felt... I didn't. I still didn't register that I had won a medal. Like, <laughs> let alone gold. Like, yeah, I didn't even register. I was just like, oh, I won. Like, mm. yeah, that's cool. Just won a race. Just won a race. Yeah. Like, I'm fastest in the world this year. This is cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I was just emotional after. Yeah. Because I think like it's the first competition I've ever been allowed to go to, and I was just emotional. And then. I remember because the security was really tight at London. Yeah. And I remember just being like. I need to go see my mum and my coach <laughs> right now. And I'm going to go. <laughs> and I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember my mum was actually on the back row at the stadium oh, really? and I literally pelted it all no the way, way up the stairs and my legs were on fire <laughs> by the end With of the it. With the metal bands around your neck yeah. all the way up. Um, and it was really nice because um, like, I felt safe, felt like a family atmosphere there. Yeah. What, the whole games? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. It was really nice. So, like, I ran up and not one point did I feel unsafe. And my mum had told everyone, they were like, oh, it's your little girl. She's like, so that was quite cool. But oh, it amazing. didn't really fully register that I was at, like, Games. a parallel. Yeah, because until I did, like, the third turn. So I think I was fifth after 100 metres. Okay. And then I remember going up that third length and then turning. And then I must have turned in third. I knew that I'd turned in a position because the crowd just went really? bananas. And I could <laughs> feel them stamping on the stadium. Yeah. And then I just remember just gritting my teeth and just my coach was like, no one gets disqualified for dying, so just go <laughs> for it. Oh, that's amazing. So is that, you, do you really just knew that you were in a medal position on that last 15, you just felt yeah. like it was your time to go? Yeah. So is that the way you mentioned about fe yeah. training for feel? Did yeah. Did you just feel that was the right yeah. way to go? Yeah. We spoke to, um, in the first season of the podcast, we spoke to Richard Whitehead. Yeah. And he said after the 2012 Games, there was a massive, he felt like there was a massive shift for Paralympic sport. Mm -hmm. Did you feel the same? Um, I think it was difficult for me because I was never involved in the Paralympic mm. sport before 2012. Okay. So I never really knew. So I watched the Olympics in 2008. Yeah. I remember watching Michael Phelps, the typical swimmer thing, being yeah. like, oh my God, he's amazing. <laughs> I want to swim. Um, so I watched that and I was like, yeah. And then I don't think I actually watched the Paralympics in 2008. Okay. It wasn't really a thing. And then obviously every year since, it seems to have got bigger and bigger. So were you swimming in 2008 still though? Yeah, I just joined like a... Okay, so you so had you joined as a non-para swimmer just swimming because yeah. you loved it? Yeah. Okay, so did you have any... I, I'll tell you a story. I <laughs> didn't join myself. My mum signed me up because I was getting in trouble at school. Oh, really? Yeah. So is this Too a, much energy. Oh, really? So this is a way to... Burn it off. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So did you did you feel like that worked? Yeah, because I was tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So that must have been... So how old were you then when you joined the swimming club then? I want to say nine or ten. Okay. It was, it was quite late for a swimmer. Yeah, so was that, did you feel quite uncomfortable at school compared to in the pool then? Yeah. Was that just where you were? Yeah, at home? The, the pool felt like I was in a normal thing, whereas school I was like in a special unit and I was a special kid and yeah. it was quite annoying. <laughs> okay, that's, um, that's really cool. I think so many people you speak to around sport, you know, find it as the place they enjoy to be, but yeah. I think from what you're saying there, it was just a place you had to, you just found yourself, I guess. So yeah. was that an instant switch almost in, we mentioned earlier about your confidence and how you felt more comfortable as you were kind of 15, 16, getting older and older. Mm -hmm. Was that straight away when you joined swimming, did you just feel a difference? 
Um, I think basically I just started swimming. I didn't even know how to swim. Okay. I knew how to swim. My mum taught me how to swim without armbands at 18 months old. But like, wow. <laughs> um, but it was just to survive. It wasn't like any skills yeah. or anything. So I just joined to learn some skills. Um, and then eventually I just loved it more and more and more. And then um, I started competing, but I didn't really enjoy it. Yeah. I used to get beaten by the same girl every competition. <laughs> I used to hate it. And then one competition, I was like, you know, I am fed up with being beaten by her. And then I actually tried really hard okay. and then beat her. And then I was like, ah, oh, this is cool. I like winning. <laughs> <laughs> and you started from there. Yeah, and then everything away. just spiraled from <laughs> there. And then there was a girl in the club who used to swim at the Special Olympics and was like, oh, you could actually get her classified for Paralympics. Mm. So then we just went through that kind of process. That's amazing. One thing that really interests me around, because I work a lot in non para women, but para women is on mainstream TV, it's Channel 4, mm -hmm. for Europeans, I think World Championships yeah. as well. But then non para swimming isn't on mainstream TV unless it's yeah. the Olympics. Yeah. What do you think para swimming has done so well? I think um, it's difficult because all of us look at the able-bodied and think, why is theirs on the BBC Red Button? Okay. Because ours is just a highlight show. Okay. Ours isn't actually. So if you swam and you didn't swim that well, you wouldn't be shown. Okay. So we only get a highlight show about two weeks after. But they okay. put it on the link on their 4OD, I think it is, or okay. something like that. Um, so we always look at the able body and say, oh, why? Yeah. But I think they did a big bid for it in 2012, and then they've just continued paying for the rights of our thing. Yeah. And I think Channel 4 like us because of the they're quite diverse channel, aren't yeah. they? So... Um, I think definitely after 2012, Channel 4 really kind of took the reins with Parasport. Yeah. Is that, do you, do you feel like that as well then? Do you feel like they really yeah. kind of care, I guess? Yeah, they are um, they obviously support diversity and um, I guess the Paralympics is a great way to show that. Yeah, definitely. So, but yeah, I think they've done a really good job at showcasing like, mm. they've been like one of the biggest reasons Paralympics has got better. Yeah. And do you see that carrying on? Do you see Paralympics becoming more and more prevalent as... We move on through the exercise. Like, it would 10, be nice. Years. It would be really nice because obviously the Paralympics change all the time. Um, yeah. Obviously, 2012 was the first time I was allowed to compete. And then there's like more and more different classes and more and more sports that are going to be allowed to take place. Yeah. So, fingers crossed it will get a little bit more awareness. What do you see as the next step that Paris women needs or, or should be going, if that makes sense? It would, it's not even just para, it would be nice if swimming in general was yeah. on the TV. Mm. Just Definitely. like football, yeah. but obviously we don't have the money in it like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> football. But um, I think, I don't know if you've watched it, but the Australian trials yeah. being on Amazon is pretty yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And do you think that's a way that, I guess, British women should go in terms of integrating, because Australian trials is integrated, isn't it, with yeah. para and non-para swimming? Do you think that's a good thing or do you think that's... I think that's really good. We used to do that for nationals yeah. and we used to work, and British champs, and it used to work really well. But I think think like it can be difficult sometimes to incorporate us because sometimes the lower classes take a long time and okay. it can be quite annoying I think for the able-bodied swimmer to sit around and wait for someone that takes 10 minutes to swim a 400. <laughs> okay so if we um if we go then you know we've just gone through kind of 18 months now of a coronavirus yeah. pandemic you obviously trained in a swim spa the whole way through pretty much all three lockdowns we've had mm -hmm. and then you had a TikTok that went yeah. very viral. I think probably <laughs> yeah. one of the most viral clips of, of a swimmer ever, I yeah. guess. I think, has it had over 30 million views? Yeah, 30 million or 29.9 or something. <laughs> stupid, yeah. Why do you think this blew up so, so much? Um, well, basically we had like some crazy weather and yeah. the tub was like fully snowed on. It was yeah. like a good 10 metres of snow on the top of the lid. And um, I just thought it'd be really funny it wasn't even for TikTok at the time, just to go out there in my wellies and just be like a bit of a numpty. Yeah. Be like, oh, I'm swimming in the snow, get me. <laughs> um, and I put it together, not thinking at all about what was going to happen because yeah. none of my TikToks had many views at all. Okay. Um, and I just put it together and I basically just wrote on there, um, this is how much I want to get to Tokyo. I'm training in the snow in minus two. Yeah. Um, body bar. <laughs> and then it just people just started arguing on oh, it really? in the comment section. I think because people are arguing, every comment boosts 
the post. Yeah, the engagement. Um, so they were saying, minus two isn't cold, you should try swimming in Canada, it's minus 52. <laughs> and then I was like, that's not really the idea of it, but... Yeah. And then it was like, you shouldn't be in the Paralympics, you've got all your arms and legs, there's nothing wrong with you. And then there was just, it's not cold. Um, inappropriate comments. <laughs> Um, and then just like, they were talking about like the jacuzzi and like, why is she swimming on the spot? She's not going anywhere. What's she yeah. going to achieve with just swimming on the spot? People and, not really getting it. And then well. they were like, <laughs> how is she just not moving? Like, what is she doing? Why yeah. is she just floating in the swimming pool? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, you just mentioned there around you getting a little bit of, I guess, hate comments. Yeah. Do you, so social media, do you find that to be benefit as an athlete or do you find that to have a little bit of a negative effect sometimes? I feel like... Um, now like obviously i won in 2012 but um i feel like now if you want any sponsorship deals or anything you've got to be an influencer yeah and you've got to have the followers and you've got to have social media presence if not they're not interested yeah whereas it's not like the days of gary lineker getting sponsored by walkers and stuff yeah. like that it's not <laughs> people are not really interested in that anymore they want the influencers to promote their products and they want good content and yeah. um, so I feel like if you want to be part of that, you have to be present on social media and you have to be yeah. rigid in what you post and what you can and can't post and make sure you don't upset anyone. Yeah. Do you, um, do you get a lot of hate comments or...? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, quite a lot. Um, I started to get most... I got a lot of hate in 2012, but I managed to just block those people and then they never kind of come back. Yeah. But I think after TikTok hitting so many people, it kind of just went a bit crazy with the hate okay it was just like extremes from you're not disabled you're only missing the eyelash or you're too fat to swim or you're not built right to swim um and it was just like did you find that difficult to deal with um it did get to me a bit but at the same time i kind of laughed it off and was like you literally don't know nothing yeah so I, th I think that's a quite powerful thing to do as in you know you're obviously training as taking every eventuality to be able to train to go and chase your goal and I guess when when people just kind of try and rip that apart I think it's quite a, a hard thing to just kind of brush it off but it sounds like you did quite a good job of it yeah I think um I think swimming and stuff makes you tough doesn't it um, yeah and it only makes you stronger what you've been through so them just hating on me for absolutely no reason <laughs> for doing really well in life <laughs> was like just I could just shrug it off and just be like okay whatever yeah like this is just a comment on the video and actually you commenting on the video is actually boosting the video so <laughs> that's <laughs> how I memory. looked at it yeah yeah that's cool so like we mentioned there you trained all through three lockdowns with the jacuzzi swim spa yeah so you I believe you're the only elite para swimmer that decided not to move mm -hmm. to a national center yeah and have access to a swimming pool throughout the lockdowns yeah. and you know every training facility could ask for what's what was the decision behind that um Basically, I love where I live, yeah. um, and I have three dogs. Um, and if I was to up and move, my dogs would either have to come with me, or yeah. my mum would have to quit her job. <laughs> um, but mental health-wise, I didn't see it being very good for my mental health to just up and move and live in a hotel room for yeah. the foreseeable future, um, because it was going to be really strict. You wasn't going to be allowed to leave the hotel room for other than swimming. Whereas here, I could go for walks. I could take my dogs out for a walk. I could go for bike rides. And yeah, I just really enjoy where I live. And I thought I'd rather be happy and yeah. healthy than stressed. Um, but with the swimming pool? Yeah. So do you, did you struggle with, say, your, your mental health? Or did you yeah. find it really hard not having access to a normal swimming pool? Yeah, I found it hard because a lot of people posting on social media, i just done the final session of the week on yeah. Saturday. And I was like, oh, I would absolutely love to be in a swimming yeah. pool right now. And I found it hard. But I think it probably made me mentally tougher because I was like, right, I'm going to go out and have a really good bike session. I'm going to go get in the swim spa yeah. and uh, just do my thing. And at the end of the day, I would just want it to be happy and enjoy what I was doing rather than think about all the pressures of everything else that everyone yeah. else will be feeling. I guess that's a great perspective to have in terms of you're not just kind of, you know, obviously a lot of people struggle through lockdowns with mental health and stuff, but you found that you almost accepted that and then turned it around into a positive in terms yeah. of how much better it's going to make you as an athlete and how much more yeah. I guess well made you 10 times more determined I guess yeah. to succeed at Tokyo knowing yeah. the struggle it's had to be yeah definitely and I'm really lucky I've got a really good support network like I just my coach was on furlough and obviously he wasn't coaching but 
I would ring him up monthly and be crying on the phone to him. Oh, I just want to swim and stuff like that. And then obviously my mum bed most of it because I live with her. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it was really hard, but I they really supported me for everything. And they how, how important do you think that support network is to succeeding as an athlete? So important because I feel like if you've got someone to talk to about your worries, then it just it's going to make it a lot easier. Um, and my coach is really good. Like he always backs what yeah. I what I say, and we'll just go with it. Um, but at the same time, he will tell me if I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. So um, yeah, it was just great to have him just being like, "You are making the right decisions." Don't worry about what everyone else is doing. Just concentrate on yourself. Like if you need a day off take a day off yeah like don't stress too much about doing too much if you're doing too much it's going to make it worse yeah oh that's that's great i think so many athletes support sorry talk about their support network being often the key to their success yeah. and it's almost like they're doing everything they can as an athlete but if they haven't got that network they yeah it just wouldn't happen do you feel yeah. the same yeah definitely um the amount of time <laughs> i had to break down on my coach and just cried before my race yeah and I wouldn't have made it to my race if my coach hadn't have physically took me to the <laughs> call-up room yeah, and like, grabbed you and walked you down. yeah and been like you are going to be okay and you're going to dive in this race and you're going to do it like this yeah so yeah without him without my mum and my partner now because I nag to him a lot about how much <laughs> yeah <laughs> how annoying I find it when everyone else is training and I can't train so um yeah yeah that's, that's amazing so looking forward then Tokyo yeah. Are you feeling really confident ahead of it? Um, probably not so much, but I guess there's not really much I can do about it now. The damage has been done, so the only thing I can do now is just do the best I can now leading into the Games and then just see what happens. But my main competition are Australian and Japanese, and I know them pretty well, and they've okay. been training the entire time. <laughs> okay. I guess, you, um, I guess like you mentioned earlier, though, that mental resilience, I guess when you're standing on the blocks, no one can want to win as much yeah. as you have after the last kind of year and a half, you know, that inner confidence of yeah. knowing you've done everything you can, surely that's going to be yeah. a massive boost. Yeah, it is. And the, the biggest thing, I don't know who said it to me, but the only thing that people from the outside looking in see is that time. Yeah. They don't see the excuse next to your name, oh, there was a pandemic, oh, I broke my ankle like last month. Yeah. They don't see that. They just see the time in your place. Yeah. So that's, you don't really have an excuse because that is... That's yeah. what it is. That's the result. You can't do anything about it. Yeah. So then if you look past Tokyo, mm -hmm. how long do you see yourself staying in, say, competitive swimming for yourself? Yeah. I'm actually really excited because for the first time ever, female S14s are going to be allowed to compete at the commies. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Um, male S14s have been allowed to compete for the last two cycles, but not females. Okay. Um, how come? No idea. No idea. Okay. No idea. <laughs> um, so... I'll definitely be hanging around for those. So that's um, another home games then in Birmingham? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm really excited about those. And then potentially, if it's only two more years, I might just see it through. Yeah. Um, and then it literally just depends on what the rest of the world are doing. Because yeah. I'm, I'm not a sore loser, but like I'm not going to be hanging around if I'm not <laughs> going to be making a final and stuff. So, yeah. yeah. That's fair enough. And do you see yourself then moving out of swimming for yourself and either you know coaching or helping young swimmers mentor yeah. and that kind of thing? I did do my level one teaching. I do want to go into that, but at the same time, responsibilities stress me out sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm really like happy with how my life is at the minute. Um, and I don't really see my life changing any time in the future other than potentially, I don't know. I just seem to give all my time to charity stuff. So, like, I just give all my time to looking after rescue dogs. So, yeah. potentially, I want to open my own rescue, but I just know that's uh, debt for the rest of my yeah. life. <laughs> that's a, that's a long-term <laughs> commitment, isn't it? So, yeah. is it just is it animal charities you're mainly involved in? Yeah, um, and I also do. Um, I volunteer for a company called Olio. It's not a charity, but I basically go and collect at a set time all of a store's waste okay. that wow. they would have binned that night. So I did it last night, and I will take it all, then I'll bring it all home, photograph every single item, upload it to an app, and then people will say what oh, they wow. want, and then I get it ready, and then they come and collect what they want. Do you think that spreads from your support network? You've mentioned around how you feel your support network have really helped you, and do you think that kind of filters down into you wanting to help other people as well? 
Yeah, definitely. My mum has always been a really hard worker and she gives a lot to everyone else. Um, and she never really takes much time to herself. So no. I think it probably rubs off on me a bit. So, um, yeah, she definitely yeah. M probably makes me give a lot more than I need to. That's awesome. Thanks again for joining us. That's been amazing. And best of luck for Tokyo this year. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us on the Jacuzzi Performance Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the channel wherever you're watching us. Leave a like and leave a comment or a view letting us know what you'd like us to ask our guests. We'll see you next time.